Hello you guys and welcome to my channel. I'm so excited to have you here. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the multi-level marketing company, Lou LaRoe, and the recent documentary that was made on Amazon Prime Video about this multi-level marketing company. The documentary is called Lula Rich, and I thought it would be really cool if we could all kind of walk through the documentary, all of the episodes. There was a total of four episodes ranging from 42 to 48 minutes. Now watching this documentary, I truly believe it showcased a backstage view of what we do don't really get to see in multi-level marketing companies. A lot of the times we only see what is presented to us by the MLM reps and by the CEOs of the company themselves. We don't get a true understanding of what's actually going on in these companies. So in the documentary, they went through essentially the beginning of LuLaRoe, the whole journey and how we got to where we are today with this company. We're also able to see a lot of people getting interviewed from MLM expert Robert Fitzpatrick, all the way to a previous designer that actually designed the LuLaRoe leggings to pass corporate workers, past MLM reps that were in LuLaRoe that got all the way to the top and even actual reps that are in the MLM still. We even got to see some journalists get interviewed. So I really feel like this documentary got a hold of a lot of different people coming from a lot of different angles of the company, which I really enjoyed. I think that's a great way to do a documentary is to be able to see things from a million different sides. And we even got to see the CEOs being interviewed, Mark and Deanne, the CEOs of this multi marketing company and I thought it was quite interesting that they took on this interview in the first place. So when I was scripting out this video I thought that it would be perfect to kind of go episode by episode and I thought it would be interesting to really just have a conversation about a lot of things that happen in this documentary because I feel like it's very eye-opening to what was happening in LuLaRoe but also what happens to many multi-level marketing companies and I think a lot of individuals in different MLMs can really relate to the things that were talked about in this documentary too. So to start LuLaRoe was actually founded in 2000 12 by Deanne Brady and her husband Mark. LuLaRoe was actually named after Deanne's first three granddaughters, Lucy, Lola, and Monroe. So LuLaRoe. And then keep in mind during this time, in order to join LuLaRoe, you actually had to spend about five to ten thousand dollars, which allowed you to get inventory to sell. So when LuLaRoe started, they actually had an opportunity for people to buy inventory, and that is how you essentially got into the MLM. But keep in mind, it took about five to ten thousand thousand dollars just to get your inventory to get started in this company and I think that's important to start off with. So instead of buying things like a website or anything like that, like we see a lot of multi-level marketing companies do now like Monate, Beachbody, all of these other companies where people can go on a website and kind of purchase a product, that wasn't what was happening with LuLaRoe. With LuLaRoe you actually had to go to a rep and the rep would have the inventory that you would get to choose from. So with episode one, I started off with the interviewer asking how LuLaRoe got started and they were actually asking Mark and Deanne how the MLM got started and kind of the story behind it. So I thought we'd go over that. So essentially Mark's story kind of said that, oh, he was taught by his dad that the worst thing in the world essentially was being flat broke and there's nothing worse than being flat broke. So that's kind of his little story. So Deanne actually started years ago buying dresses from a store to sell herself. So she walked into a store one day, she's seen a bunch of dresses and she decided, oh, I'm just going to buy a bunch of these and then I'm going to go home and I'm going to sell these dresses. And she ended up actually selling 300 dresses in a very short period of time. And then from that point on, she actually grew a partnership with that dress company to sell their dresses. She actually ended up bringing back $40,000 in profit. And she did that for 28 years. So this actually led Deanne to selling maxi skirts because I definitely remember maxi skirts were way more common back in the day. So her husband, Mark, would actually go to a fabric company or a fabric store and he would actually order just a bunch of different fabrics, bring home the fabrics for Deanne and then she would make a bunch of these maxi skirts at home. But with that being said, this is kind of where Mark and Deanne got the idea for LuLaRoe and how to have prints for a short period of time. So Mark wanted to create the sense of urgency with these maxi dresses. So he would only purchase a small amount of each print, which would make this sense of urgency for customers to be like, oh, if you better buy it now, or you may never see this print again. And then that's kind of how that led into LuLaRoe because we hear a lot where LuLaRoe reps would state, oh, this print, you know, they only have 300 of them or a thousand of them. You have to buy from me in order to get this print because it's going to be going out of stock because they only have a short amount of products. So that was interesting to hear how that kind of got started in LuLaRoe all the way back from Mark and Deanne kind of working with getting these maxi skirts going. So from that point on, Deanne actually had a friend that wanted to sell maxi skirts with her. And the rest is kind of history. This is how 
how LuLaRoe had begun and how they kind of got their idea to start this multi-level marketing company. So something I found interesting was how did the two of them hear about MLMs? You know, how did they get this idea to start it? And Mark stated he had his parents that were Amway distributors. So he clearly has a background with having parents that did multi-level marketing companies like Amway. And then Deanne stated that she actually tried to do Amway herself. So this actually brings up a great point and something I'm asked all of the time, like how did CEOs come up with these MLM companies? Why do they? And a lot of the times MLM companies are started by people who have had a previous experience with them, whether they were actually in an MLM themselves in the past, whether they have had their parents in one or a friend or whatever it may be, they normally have some type of affiliation with multi-level marketing companies before they start their own. I've done many, many, many deep dives in the past of different multi-level marketing companies and I have found that this is exactly what happens. Most of the time when I do these deep dives on these MLM companies and these CEOs, I always found out that, oh, that person was actually a rep in Amway, you know, 20, 30 years ago, or they had a friend or a parent, or maybe they worked in corporate at an MLM company and then they wanted to start their own. So I think this really showcases that this is a common thing with multi-level marketing companies and how these CEOs come up with the idea to start one is most of the time having experience or being in one themselves. So from here, something I really liked in episode one is when they brought in an MLM expert, Robert Fitzpatrick. And this came after, you know, Deanne and Mark talked about the fact that they were affiliated with Amway and their parents were, and Deanne tried to get into it. They kind of cut a scene to the MLM expert, Robert, showcasing how Amway was pretty much the thing that took MLMs to where they were to where they are now. And something he stated, and I felt he stated it in a very good way, was Amway developed a model that converted the salesperson into the customer. So the money would be made by multiplying the salespeople by getting them to buy into it with fees and purchases that would create the main stay of revenue. Then clearly, like he stated, all you have to do is make the case that you have something great to offer, recruits pay an entry fee, and then they purchase a product. And that's kind of where the money comes from. So Amway was really the pinnacle moment for multiple marketing companies when they kind of the start of all of this. And you'll hear that a lot when people talk about MLMs and how they started and how they got to where they are. Amway is kind of like that MLM that you hear people talk about most. Now we went into kind of seeing a bunch of different interviews with a mix of people from former reps to current reps. And again, even the MLM expert, Robert, I did appreciate the fact that they interviewed current reps too. So when they were interviewing all these people in the first episode, you kind of seen a very similar reasoning as to why all of these former reps and even the rep that was interviewed that is a rep still, you kind of got the same story as to why all of them started. All of them were kind of sold the sense of hope, like, oh, this can be the thing for you. And, and isn't that like a dream come true that you could just stay home and sell clothes? And all of these reps, as you can see, were what? They were women, they were mothers, they were either stay-at-home moms, or they wanted to be. And if you look at most of the marketing companies as a whole, you will see that the largest demographic sought after is women or mothers and people who are maybe stay-at-home moms or want to be. And you could kind of see that similarity with LuLaRoe. So we could see that these women were willing to do anything in order to join LuLaRoe, in order to get involved with something that was giving them hope in the moment, even if it was that they didn't tell their spouse or that they took out a loan. And some of them even sold their breast milk just to get started in these multiple marketing companies. So this is very common in MLMs where you will see people told or it's insinuated that, oh, you should do whatever you can, whether you ask your grandma if you can borrow money from her or you do it on a credit card or you go get a loan out. Like you are taught that this MLM can be the thing for you that is going to take you from where you are now to where you want to be. And because of that, a lot of people are willing to do whatever they can to kind of join the MLM, no matter the cost, unfortunately. So this led us into the end of the episode. So episode one ended kind of with talking about how much the company grew and they were stating how it grew way too fast for them to handle. And that'll be really important when we go and talk about the lawsuits and, you know, the moldy leggings. It also stated that by 2016, LuLaRoe made over $70 million, which led them to recruit all of their children into working in the company. So they were starting to see Mark and Deanne that this company was going too fast for them. So they ended up hiring like their whole family. They had this weird like family meeting with their millions of children and kind of started hiring all of them as, you know, these high up positions in corporate to work because this company, in my opinion, was just going way too fast for them. And it was something they couldn't handle. Towards the end, they also introduced Daryl, which he actually worked 
worked in corporate in LuLaRoe, more so on the customer service side of things. And he had a lot of interesting things to say. So that kind of leads us into episode two. Episode two really focused on the onboarding process for LuLaRoe, prices to get started in the MLM, which I kind of touched on a little bit, ranks, how to achieve them, FOMO, how much of the MLM focused on recruitment and more. I feel like this episode had a ton of information, like just a ton when it comes to talking about the rank structure and all of that. So I was glad that they did talk about that because that's very important when we talk about MLMs and pyramid schemes and things like that. It's important to look at rank structures and comp plans and how can you build yourself up in this company? Is it by recruitment only? or can you actually make money selling the product? So this episode starts off with the reps really emphasizing how much, again, that they would do in order to join this company. MLM really emphasizes that you need to do anything you can to join because then once you join, then everything will change and that it's gonna be possible for everyone to learn money. When we know by the statistics, when we look at these specific MLMs and their yearly income disclosure statements to past studies that have been done at multi-level marketing companies, all the way to what the FTC says about MLM, that it is not common and most people who join MLMs lose money, make no money or go into debt per the FTC. So unfortunately, all these things that these reps were being told to do or feeling like they had to do to join to change their life is unfortunately not going to change their life for the better in the end. And we've seen that in this documentary. So we got to see in the beginning kind of like the product prices, like how much it costs for these reps to get started in LuLaRoe in general. So as I told you guys, it was anywhere from five to $10,000 to get started in this MLM. But the issue that arised was every time you would run out of inventory, you just had to buy again thousands more of inventory to keep selling. So in my opinion, it's kind of like, oh, well, you're going to go spend $10,000 or $5,000. You're going to sell all that inventory, barely make a profit if you even are someone who gets to sell it all and then have to redo that again. A lot of what these MLM reps were seeing was whenever they would join the company, they would spend thousands and then they would sell about thousand. And then they would just have to spend it again. So it's kind of like being on this hamster wheel. You're just circling and circling and circling. You're never actually profiting anything. So like I said, it's pretty much like a hamster wheel. You would sell just to continue to spend that money again. On top of that, you could not even request certain prints of leggings. I found this really interesting. So you were essentially buying a random inventory of leggings, hoping that you would receive some worth selling, which for a lot of people, as time went on, their prints were getting a little bit weird, which we'll talk about again in a future episode. So so being on the topic of product packages, we actually got to see how the onboarding system worked for these reps. So I was very shocked by this. I had no clue any, any of this information, but essentially when someone would want to join LuLaRoe, they would actually get onboarded by the company itself. So the corporate workers that were getting paid, you know, hourly wages and salaries to work in the corporate building were the ones onboarding these reps. Normally in MLMs, we see the upline is the one in control of onboarding or doing anything like that. So Lachey, an actual like past corporate worker stated that they wanted, aka Mark and Deanne, wanted their own corporate workers to to be onboarding 24 seven, up to 500 people a day, they would want them onboarding. So as we could see, in my opinion, Mark and Deanne really only were thinking about how much more money we can make, how many more people can we get into this MLM. We also have to remember that all of this stuff was happening around 2016. And this was a time, in my opinion, where there wasn't that much information online, even if information was available, because there was very minimal information available. You had the Reddit thread that was anti-MLM, the anti-MLM Reddit thread, I believe, came out in 2011. But the issue was, was even if something was online, like information or, you know, something that could help these reps, you had to know what to look for in order to find the information. So you may have wanted to know about LuLaRoe. So maybe you went on Google and you Googled what is LuLaRoe, but all you're going to see is a bunch of posts that were saying good things about it. Nothing that was truly critiquing the MLM itself or going through things like income disclosure statements and is the investment of five to $10,000 on leggings for print that you don't even know what's coming in. Is it actually worth it? And are you actually going to make your investment back? Now in 2021, it's different. We do have the opportunity for anyone, if they Google LuLaRoe or any MLM company to see a bunch of links come up from, you know, articles to deep dives here on YouTube or conversations here on YouTube to the Reddit thread. Like there are a bunch of different places that are now open for individuals to get information. I feel like that made it really easy for these reps to get caught and trapped into these MLMs 
items because there wasn't as much readily available information online. So again, I was actually excited to see that from here in episode two, they were talking about the ranks and how to achieve them. So they actually had five ranks. So the first rank was retailers. So that means that you were fresh in the company. You had just gotten started. But in order to keep that rank, you had to buy a certain amount of LuLaRoe pieces, the leggings, a month in order to stay active. The second rank was the sponsor rank. So at the sponsor rank, you'd actually have to sign up one person. So you'd have to have one recruit and then you would get commission off how many clothes they bought, not how much they sold to customers. So if you had just recruited one person into LuLaRoe, you would then have that person buy, you know, inventory, whether it be $5,000. That's just the one I'm going to stick to. 5000 I feel like that's a easy number to go by. But you would essentially have that downline individual spend about $5,000 and you would get an immediate bonus check from that recruit buying that product. From there, the third rank was called trainer. So you would actually get this rank when you had 10 recruits under you. So you would be getting 5% off how many pieces were ordered. So again, off of each individual that signed up with LuLaRoe, you would get 5% of what they were buying. And on top of that, you were getting what is called a trainer bonus. And these bonuses are going to be really important. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The fourth rank would be the coach rank. That means you have three trainers under you. So this is kind of where the pyramid structure really starts to begin because you have what? You are a coach rank, three trainers are under you, meaning all three of those people have at least 10 people under them. And then the last level is the mentor level that is the highest level in the company. That means that you have three coaches under you and three trainers under them. So you have really built this huge downline of individuals and you're at that top tier. You're in that 0.1% of the company making a large portion of your money off of your bonus check. So something I thought was really important to point out about this was reps at the top were making bonus bonuses just based off products bought by their downline. They weren't making a portion of what their downline was selling. They were making a portion just off of what their downline was buying. On top of that, the only way to advance, as I just told you guys how to get these ranks, the only way to advance in these companies is to recruit people. So the more you recruited people, the more inventory your downline bought, the larger your bonus checks were, and the higher you got into the company. In my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, when you see something like this happening, whether it's a different multi-level marketing company or whatever, I would run in the opposite direction. That is just my opinion. If recruitment in the comp plan is the only thing being incentivized and the only thing being taught and talked about, that means that you only have the potential to make money that way. You have to recruit in this MLM in order for you to try and even make money. So when you look at a comp plan for an MLM and you see that recruitment is the only thing being incentivized and that's the only way you have the potential to make some money, in my opinion, that's, that's a pyramid scheme. So we actually got to hear from Roberta, who is an ex-rep. I know this individual. She is really amazing. She's done some amazing things since she has gotten out of LuLaRoe herself. She is an ex-rep. So Roberta actually stated that she essentially bought in her year and a half being in LuLaRoe, she bought $78,000 of leggings, $78,000 of leggings, because again, you're in a hamster wheel at this point. You sell $1,000 worth of product, you then have to put that money right back in to continue to do it. She bought that $78,000 of wholesale of LuLaRoe and she sold about $83,000. So when we look at that, it's only about a $5,000 profit. But she also stated that after business expenses, it was kind of a wash for her. She would have to essentially spend money on business expenses like parties, like hosting things at your house and buying food and having people over to look at your you know, clothing and having trouble shows and all of that stuff. So you would end up spending all of that money anyway. So you weren't really pocketing any money off of selling the product itself. But she then stated that as she was growing in the company, I believe she said she had about 75 people in her downline in general when she was in LuLaRoe and she made about 65,000 or over 65,000 just on bonuses. So that means just off the people under her that bought product, she made that money. So as we can see, the drastic difference made between buying products and actually selling them compared to the amount of money people are making with these bonus checks is insane. That's the money. The bonus checks is what they pocket. The bonus checks are what goes in the upline's pockets themselves. That money, well, they could put it back into the company itself, but that money is being put 
to them. It's not being made off products sold or anything like that. So we can kind of see that she was making way more. She was profiting way more off her downline buying products than she was when, you know, she would actually sell the product. So this again leads to a larger issue of recruitment being pushed more than actually selling a product. And for all of the top reps that have been interviewed in this documentary said very similar things. Another top rep stated that behind the scenes, she was even taught that for her bonus checks, she needed to flaunt the money made from them. Another top rep said that she had posted a photo on social media of her house because she had a really nice house in a really nice neighborhood. And when she posted the photo and didn't thank Lou LaRoe, allegedly Deanne actually called her actually mad, like upset that she didn't hashtag the post with because Lou LaRoe. So because she didn't hashtag a photo of her house with because of Lou LaRoe, the CEO of the dang company was calling her mad at her. So this really represented what we see in many MLMs. We see that in most of the marketing companies, what are they trying to portray? Most of the time, they're trying to portray this lifestyle. They're going on social media, they're flaunting things like their new cars, their new homes, their new Gucci bags, Louis Vuitton bags, this specific lifestyle, right? They're going to fancy dinners, they're doing fancy things that a lot of people may crave, a lot of people may want. And by portraying this, you know, high-end lifestyle, this lifestyle that anybody can attain when we know it's not true, that is how they are recruiting more people. By portraying that lifestyle, it would allow others on social media to sign up with them thinking that they could do it too. And that's unfortunately what was being taught by the company LuLaRoe itself and the CEOs. So I truly believe this happens in every MLM. I talk about it with every MLM and that's what I want to do today is really be able to relate. What are we seeing in LuLaRoe that also relates to every other multi-level marketing company out there? When we look at things like Monet or other companies with the car program like Thrive, all of these programs, what are they doing? They're flaunting their cars online. They're saying, oh, well, you can do it too. And putting a dang income disclosure on the bottom line in itty bitty writing. So we see this happening with every MLM. Let me know down below if you see it happening with every MLM. I know I do. I know I'm sent all of the time posts and videos of people flaunting this lifestyle and portraying a lifestyle that they know individuals on social media will get kind of like FOMO with and want to join because they want it too. So this isn't just in LuLaRoe. This is in every MLM. So towards the end, the interviewer actually asked Mark and Deanne what they had to say about the bonus checks. Like, what did they have to say about their rank structure, the bonus checks? Why are they essentially making so much off bonus checks versus selling products? Deanne literally stopped Mark from speaking because Mark kind of like wanted to take the stand on the question and speak. And Deanne stated he would be too logical with this answer which I found funny. I'm like, oh, okay. So he can't, he can't speak because he's going to be too logical. So Deanne responded saying, well, this biz was growing so fast and I was doing so much of the training. So wouldn't it be awesome if they got a little bit for just telling their story? So Deanne insinuated that she was the one that was doing a lot of the trainings, her business and the company was growing so fast. So why not give a little bit of money to these uplines that share their stories on social media? Problem with this is these reps were just getting a little bit for telling their story. They were getting hundreds of thousands of dollars off of recruiting people, off of these bonus checks. They didn't even have to sell any products. They just had to convince people on social media that they should join too. And then once the person joins and buys inventory, they were getting these huge bonus checks. And then they were buying inventory, these downlines, buying thousands of thousands of dollars worth of inventory that they would probably never be able to sell. So yes, there's a problem with it and they're not just getting paid a little bit. So the last thing I have to say about episode two, there was a lot of other things. Again, I'm only talking about really big things I've seen in these episodes, which is why I really recommend you go and watch it. I would also love to know down below thus far, what is something that you've seen in the documentary that I may not talk about that you found interesting or it intrigued you that you want to talk about and I will definitely be responding to as many comments as I can and we can kind of have a conversation in the comments below because if I did talk about everything we'd be here for five hours because there's so much information but towards the end something really hit me and it was when an ex-designer from the LuLaRoe you know corporate stated you would think I would be excited to be making art for a living but I was making art with a gun to my head and I found that a little bit sad because this person seemed like she, all she wanted to do was design things and all she wanted to do was be excited to design for a corporate company, but she felt so much pressure each day just working in corporate that it was essentially becoming too much for her because the CEOs, Mark and Deanne, wanted
wanted the design team to make over 300 different prints a day. So from reps to individuals in corporate, they all had immense amount of pressure put upon them every single day. So this led us into episode three. When I watched this, I had a lot of frustration and that frustration came from this episode honing in on the fact that Mark and Deanne wanted to build this company all about women empowerment. In my opinion, they took women empowerment and they took that and made it work for their advantage, right? Or made it work to their advantage while doing the exact opposite. Included with that, we seen the fact that they were trying to convince their top reps to retire their spouses so that they put all their eggs into the LuLaRoe basket. We seen how they train people, issues with inventory, things about training them on how to not have victim mentality and about the beginning of their defective leggings. So let's get started with this episode. In the beginning of this episode, we've seen another clip from Roberta stating that Mark would get up on stage at events in front of all of these reps and actually read passages from the Book of Mormon and compare himself to Joseph Smith. I find it extremely problematic when a CEO at any company, most of a marketing company or not, but especially multi-level marketing companies, when they get up and they try and utilize any religion, I don't care what religion it is, any religion as a way to rope people in and keep them in, I find a very huge issue with this. Unless you work at like a church or something like that where it actually makes sense to bring religion into your job, companies tend, and especially multi-level marketing companies, tend to utilize religion in a very specific manner in order to manipulate and control their reps. And I did not like how it really seemed as if that is what was happening when you know, Mark or whatever would get up on stage and read passages like this to reps. Like, why are you reading that to them at a conference or a convention or this huge event that they're supposed to be at to learn more about how to grow their multi-level marketing business when instead you're trying to utilize religion to reel them in and manipulate them and then use motivation to also do the same thing. They were never really taught anything at these events. What Roberta said, you know, just solidified that for me. Included with this, they talked a little bit about about how reps were always looked at, like the top reps were kind of looked at as some sort of celebrity or higher power. And this brings up a good point of kind of how there's an unbalanced dynamic between upline and new recruits. So in my opinion, when you have these new reps coming in and you see these top reps kind of being looked at as celebrities, they are going to put more weight on that person. What I mean by that is when a rep says do something, you're probably going to do it or a top rep. When a top rep is teaching you on stage about, oh, in order for me to make it to this part of this company, this is what I did. You are clearly just going to listen to them because they are put above you in the MLM. They are put above you in these trainings. They are always celebrated by these companies and given gifts and going on these special cruises and special trips and having these one-on-one -on -one meetings with the CEOs and all of this stuff. So clearly you're going to have that dynamic of, oh, that's my boss. Like I kind of need to listen to what they're saying. They know what they're doing. They've gotten themselves to that, you know, place. So these reps that are coming in are just going to listen to everything that that top rep is saying. We then got to see how much LuLaRoe would try and showcase how they were all about women empowering women. In my opinion, they, they did not care about that. They did the complete opposite in this episode and this episode got me fired up. We even seen Roberta again state that Deanne would say that all women had to do was get on their knees for five minutes a day and please their husband and that their husband would just let them buy whatever they wanted in the company. I found that statement just purely disgusting. So just based off that alone, I didn't even need to see everything else in the episode to know that in my opinion, LuLaRoe clearly wanted to take the women empowerment and the feminist, you know, conversation and movement and utilize that for their own personal gain. I would love to know if you watched this episode, what did you think? So this led into actually talking about the gastric sleeve. Now I am no, you know, expert on surgeries or anything like that, but apparently Deanne would have reps coming to her telling her, oh, they hated themselves. And she would just send them to Tijuana to get gastric sleeve surgery so that they could get skinnier. Deanne actually was interviewed in this episode 
and she literally said that. She said that reps would go up to her saying how much they hated themselves and her answer would be to go get surgery to change themselves. One rep actually, instead of getting the gastric sleeve surgery, got like the balloon inserted and almost died. They're all about controlling these women to kind of build this certain image to portray, right? Because like I said before, most of our marketing companies in LuLaRoe specifically, especially in these episodes, showcase how much they were taught to portray a certain image online. And this didn't just mean buying things. This also meant looking a certain way, being a certain size. I feel many of these reps, they felt like they had to go get these gastric sleeves surgeries in order to fit in with the one specific mold that was taught, right? The one specific mold of successful individuals in the MLM. So this conversation of the gastric sleeve surgery and the one rep that actually went and got the balloon and almost died trying to fit into this one specific mold sold by CEO herself, um, this conversation kind of led into where reps were being told that they needed to spend all of their bonus checks on high-end designer bags like Louis Vuitton on brand new cars. One rep even bought two brand new cars buying nice homes, and even going to fancy dinner, spending $10,000 per dinner, just so that they can kind of portray this certain image online. So in episode two, they kind of highlighted it a little bit, but episode three is where they really focused in and honed in on this aspect, whether it's portraying the lifestyle because of the money you were earning off your bonus checks or portraying it in the way of making yourself look one certain way. So I see this in, like I said, many MLMs where reps feel the need to show off and by showing off and always saying, oh, well, you know, I got this Louis Vuitton bag because I joined LuLaRoe and you can do it too. You could live this life too. If you just joined us, like, you know, you can make it happen because everyone can make it happen. When we know that's, that's not the truth. So they create what is called FOMO, fear of missing out on their social media platforms as a way to make people on the outside or the people on social media feel as if they're missing out on something. And when people feel like they're missing out on something, they're more likely to join. So by doing all these things, it was proven to work in order to get people people recruited into the MLM. So it was just continuing to be taught to these uplines that they needed to do this and being taught to the downlines that they needed to act like this on social media so that they could also make it to that level and recruit a bunch of people. So at this point in the episode, we started to see that Lulara was growing rapidly, that they, I believe, ended up getting up to 80,000 reps that were in the MLM. And one rep brought up the fact that there ended up being so many people in her neighborhood recruited from being a customer to being a rep that now they had competition everywhere. So it really had their customers turning into their competition. So reps would actually bring up their concern of, oh, you know, this is kind of getting saturated. Like there's a lot of rep and by the company itself, their concerns would just be brought down and be like, no, you're you're just not working hard enough. So they would end up putting the blame on these reps, making them feel, oh, I'm just not working hard enough when oversaturation is a thing. Oversaturation is a thing with these MLMs. There are a certain market for certain MLMs, depending on what the product is. For this MLM, LuLaRoe, there's a certain market for leggings. There's a certain time where you're going to recruit way too many people, and then you're not going to have any more people to sell to. It's just what's going to happen. And this happens with every MLM. We hear it time and time again. Whenever a rep goes to them with their concern saying, well, I'm, I'm struggling to recruit people because everyone's a rep, or I'm struggling to sell this product because of whatever reason, they're just hit back with the you're not working hard enough. And the reason, again, that I keep pointing out these similarities between LuLaRoe and other MLMs is because 90% of the things spoken about in LuLaRoe in this documentary, Lula Rich, is what happens in other MLMs. So when we hear people say that, oh my God, my MLM is different, just because it's called something different and has a different product being sold, it's essentially the same thing. So now we enter the wet, moldy, and smelling leggings era. This was kind of like happening towards the end. So now we're towards like the end of the episode where people were starting to talk about the fact that they were getting moldy, wet, and smelly legs. So I call it the moldy, wet, and smelly leggings era. So as you already know, reps were starting to spend thousands and, well, reps were already spending thousands and thousands of dollars on inventory. Well, one day the leggings that were coming in, once reps were paying thousands of dollars for this inventory, once the inventory started arriving at the house, people were realizing that the leggings were wet, moldy, and smelly. So in the interview, Mark actually stated that they had to store their leggings 
things, their product, outdoors because they were running out of space for inventory. So the CEOs had the audacity to put all of the leggings outdoors because, again, they were running out of space in their storage. So instead of finding another location right then and there to store more leggings, they were leaving them outdoors for rain, for mold, for nasty weather conditions to essentially mess up the leggings. Now, the reps were still being sent these leggings. And when reps would actually notify LuLaRoe through customer service or notify them by posting on their social media networks, LuLaRoe would just delete their posts. They would delete their comments and their posts. And they would state that the reps were just out to get them and that there isn't a problem. Well, clearly there is a problem when these reps are seeing that the inventory they just spent thousands of dollars on was coming in wet and moldy. So from here, the quality of their leggings actually started to plummet. The reps can now tell that the material of the leggings had changed. They started getting holes in them much quicker. Reps would receive leggings already with holes in them. Designs were starting to come out weird. And what I mean by that is we've already talked about the designers saying that they were already having to pump too many designs out a day, that they weren't able to keep track of the designs to make sure that they were actually going out good. So they would start seeing that some of their leggings, you know, would have, for example, hamburger buns on them. And the hamburger buns would just be in the perfect place where the crotch was. So when someone would put on the leggings, you know what we're imagining here, what their crotch area would look like. Along with that, hems were off and messed up zippers, zippers were ripping and so much more. So kind of like the wet and moldy era turned into just the quality of the leggings all in all being messed up. So in response to all of the wet, moldy, holy leggings with hamburger prints on the crotch area. The interviewer actually kind of asked Deanne and Mark how they felt about this. And in response to all of this, Mark in the interview stated word for word, we have the highest quality control. We did not have a problem with wet leggings or with damaged leggings and products. We had a huge social media problem. We had a lot of noise over a very little actual issue and said it was a fun and exciting time. So your reps that are struggling to make money these women, because most of the reps that were in the MLM, LuLaRoe, were women. These women that were spending their hard-earned money, their own grandma's money, to buy these leggings were bringing their concerns to you about the shitty leggings that you were sending them. And he still, to this day, in 2020, 2021, thinks that it was a fun and exciting time and that there wasn't an actual issue. It was just a social media problem. In my opinion, this is a key example of how a CEO gaslights their reps. How a CEO gaslights the people that are working for them. We can clearly see how these reps were gaslit into believing that what they were experiencing and what they were seeing was false, that they were kind of in this false reality. Like, no, you're not really seeing that. You're crazy. You know, that it was all in their mind. Included with this, Mark and Deanne started having trainings for the reps. So after the moldy leggings, and all of that. And after the reps complaining, because they had all the right to complain about that, Mark and Deanne started having trainings for the reps on how to not play the victim. Meaning all the reps who showed legitimate concern were labeled as a victim seeker. It was truly disgusting for me to watch this episode and to kind of see how Mark reacted to the interview question when we could see the proof of hamburger crotches, okay? We could see the proof of ripped leggings and they were just trying to make these rep believe that like it was all in their head. So at the end of episode three, they seemed to start talking about kind of what was going to happen in the beginning of episode four. They started talking about a group called the Defectives. This was the first ever group to be made where reps actually had the opportunity and the chance to talk truthfully about the company without the company deleting their posts and deleting their comments. These reps were able to finally come together and find support where they were all struggling, right? And this gave a lot of reps the courage to speak out because they had a group of people who they could see were going through the same thing. Because when you're in an MLM and you're being gaslit and you're being told by the CEOs that everything is in your head, it's kind of hard to not tell yourself that you're crazy. So I think that this helped a lot of the reps to see that they weren't alone and that they weren't the only people going through this. They weren't crazy and they actually had support and essentially had the courage to speak out against the issues with LuLaRoe. So now we end up into episode four, which kind of focused on the lawsuits, the complaints, and the accusations accusations brought forth by the reps. So let's talk about the bonus checks for a second. They really kind of honed in on the bonus check 
change. So like I told you before, reps are being able to make money or make bonuses based off what their reps would buy. So when their downlines would buy a set amount of inventory, these reps were getting paid instantly a certain percentage based on what inventory their downlines would buy. Well, I believe they said in 2017, I'm trying to like double check and make sure I believe so. I believe in 2017 was when this rule started to change. They firstly talked about how the rules for the bonus check were changing. Instead of uplines being paid when a a rep buys products, they are being paid when a rep sells that product instead, which is how it should have been from the get-go. So during this part in the documentary, it actually showed a clip of one of the corporate workers, which was actually related to Deanna Mark, one of their children or nephews or whatever. It showed a clip of him talking about the bonus checks and stating in an actual call, the way we get away from being a pyramid scheme is that we change. I actually found that part oddly satisfying to watch because in my opinion, that was just that admitting that they were a pyramid scheme and they were trying to change this bonus program so that they can get away from being one. So after them changing the bonus checks, they started to really see a heightened amount or a large amount of lawsuits starting to come in. Now, there was a couple lawsuits they didn't really dive into that much. The one that they really dived into, which we'll talk about in a second, was the Washington versus LuLaRoe lawsuit. But the couple different lawsuits that they didn't really go over, but they touched on slightly was apparently a dozen lawsuits about different effective leggings. Apparently there were lawsuits about copyright issues. Apparently individuals were alleging that the designers were essentially stealing prints and putting it on the LuLaRoe leggings. And there were even lawsuits with Miter, who was their supplier for their clothes in the first place. And all of these lawsuits, all of these issues, the wet, moldy, smelly leggings led to the huge win and huge lawsuit with Washington and LuLaRoe. In January of 2019, Washington State filed a civil lawsuit against LuLaRoe for allegedly operating as an illegal pyramid scheme. They claimed that you could not have a successful business selling the product only if you recruit people under you and that is why it is a pyramid scheme and they were alleging that LuLaRoe was and then essentially suing them over it. In February of 2021, LuLaRoe settled the case with Washington for $4.75 million. I actually posted this in the community tab. When it happened, I was very happy to see this happen and LuLaRoe though, I need to mention, still denies of any wrongdoing. They state that they had no wrongdoing, that they were not an illegal pyramid scheme. They're not stating that they were, but they did just settle the lawsuit to kind of, you know, move forward. So now with the lawsuit happening and with the settlement, they actually agreed to change certain policies like their buyback policy. Their buyback policy was a huge issue. So apparently when you join LuLaRoe, say you bought $5,000 worth of leggings, you weren't able to get your money back from that product. There was a time where they gave people a buyback policy. They put a buyback policy into place stating that, hey, if you buy LuLaRoe leggings, you can return them with a 100% guarantee. They didn't state that this was a temporary change. They stated that this was their new policy, that you could return things. So this made people start LuLaRoe. People who were on the edge of starting or maybe wanted to but was nervous to spend so much on the leggings were more likely to join now and did join, but they also seen thousands of reps cancel their accounts and get their money back. I believe they stated that LuLaRoe actually returned about $100 million worth of product back because people were using this as their way out of LuLaRoe once the buyback policy came into place. Then they decided to one day just take away the buyback policy, LuLaRoe stating, well, it was only temporary when there was no proof that it really was temporary. So this caused all of those people that did join LuLaRoe because they seen, oh, well, there's a buyback policy now. We can get our money back if we don't like this, right? Or if it doesn't work for us. All of those people were finding themselves stuck in LuLaRoe with tens and thousands of dollars worth of products that they thought they were going to be able to return. So with the Washington, you know, lawsuit with LuLaRoe when they settled, even though they said and deny any wrongdoing, they did have to change certain policies like their buyback policy, changing it back and certain things like that. I will also link down below the lawsuit and everything if you guys want to read through it. So one more thing aside from the lawsuits that I kind of found important to talk about that wrapped up prior episodes was them going over how much Mark and Deanne really promoted their reps building a team. So in episode four, we've seen so many, just so many clips and videos where they are obviously, Mark and Deanne, they're obviously celebrating top reps and how much money they were earning by recruiting, aka through bonus checks. We even see a part where apparently Deanne was on stage. They were celebrating one person for earning a bonus check of $300,000 while the person literally stated that they only made 18000 
in in personal sales. So we could really see that Deanne and Mark cared about this. They cared about showcasing how much people were earning in these bonus checks, how much people were earning by building teams and recruiting people. Because if we see a person making $300,000 off one bonus check, one, one month making $300,000 off their recruits, but only being able to sell $18,000, that's a problem. When you are in an MLM and you see these uplines celebrated for this, it's going to reinforce it. It's going to say and make you believe that you need to do this too. It really showcases and emphasizes the incentive to recruit and it points your recruits into recruiting more because you're showcasing that they can make more money that way. So instead of Mark and Deanne actually providing facts to these reps and stating, hey, the fact is only a small percentage of people will ever get to the top. And out of that small percentage of people, a percentage of those people at the top will even make this much in bonus checks. Instead of doing that, they promote the continuation of recruitment and showcasing how everyone could do it, which we know is false. Not everybody can. And clearly, as we have seen, not everybody has. So after all of that is showed, Mark actually in the interview stated that they only track bonus checks and not retailer profits. That part of the documentary, in my opinion, told me all I needed to know. To know that CEOs of a multi marketing company only cares and only tracks bonus checks. They don't track how much retailers are making, how much they're making off of selling products. Where's their mind at? Where do we see them focusing? Where do we see they want their reps to focus on? recruiting on making these bonus checks. They don't care about, you know, retailer profits because Mark even said they don't track them. They only track bonus checks. So there's only two more parts in episode four towards the end that I thought were important to talk about. The first one was towards the end, they show a clip of Jill. Now Jill is actually a current rep. She's the one current rep with LuLaRoe that they actually interviewed. I think that that takes like courage to even answer questions on a documentary, knowing that you're a current rep, knowing that your face is being plastered on a whole like Amazon video, Amazon Prime video, and that, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of people could see you. I think that it did take her courage to be able to speak up as a current rep. But with that being said, towards the end, I found it kind of ironic that she stated, well, if LuLaRoe is found guilty, then I feel every other MLM company should be investigated as well, because I've never seen LuLaRoe do something other MLM companies have not done. Now, this part was interesting to me because she said something we all say. Anyone who makes, you know, commentary content on multi-level marketing companies that critiques multi-level marketing companies. Anyone that just does not does not agree with multi-level marketing companies or the business structure will agree with me when I say that this is, this is what we've been saying. We have been saying that multi-level marketing companies are essentially all the same. They're all under the same bracket. Some may have some things that make them differ from each other, like products that they're selling. But in general, yes, that is the issue. Is all of these companies have certain aspects that are the exact same that make it an issue, that make the business structure a problem. Problem is all MLMs do this crap. The things that I've talked about today in this video, most MLMs do. And in my opinion, I, and I know many others are working towards getting them all investigated. And I hope that this documentary, I hope that, you know, this settlement with Washington and LuLaRoe, you know, the state of Washington, that lawsuit, I hope that this leads us to having more conversations surrounding multiple marketing companies in general. The last part of episode four that was particularly sad for me to watch was how reps talked about, you know, how the former reps in the documentary were talking about how they felt when they left. So one of the reps uh, that I said, I, I personally know this individual, she's amazing and does amazing things to this day to help individuals individuals that are getting out of multiple marketing companies. She stated that when she left, she started realizing that she was predatory, even if she didn't mean to be. She said that she was struggling with depression and anxiety at that point. And I think that many people go through this. A lot of people who join MLMs may not know the truth. They may not know things like income disclosure statements. They may not know what the FTC has and still says about MLMs. They may not know what income claims are, or they may not even recognize in the moment what they're doing is wrong. But once you kind of get out out of that perspective when you're in the MLM and you leave the MLM and you kind of have this fresh perspective and you start realizing these things, it can be very hard. It can be very hard to not feel guilty and embarrassed. Um, and it can be hard to get past that. And I want people to know that if you are leaving an MLM and you feel that way and you have opened your eyes to seeing things like income disclosure statements and listening to people critique MLMs, that you're going to get through that and you're going to get through the guilt and you're going to get through the embarrassment that you may feel now. And that so many people do go 
through it. Included with that, we've seen Courtney said that she was still owed $100,000. She alleged that the, she was still owed $100,000 from LuLaRoe for return issues, defective items, and bonus errors. Also, when Courtney left the MLM, you know, people in the MLM told her that they were essentially told that they were to have no association with her. And if they did have any association with her, they would be terminated. Included with that, it was said that over a hundred LuLaRoe retailers or ex-reps had to file for bankruptcy and many of them lost their marriages. They lost everything. So all in all, I really did think this documentary was, oh, and by the way, that's the end of us talking about episode four. If you guys have anything specific you want to talk about from that episode, comment it down below. So all in all, I did think this documentary was very well done. I did like that they had four episodes because I felt like they could hone in on certain things for each episode. I do think that it came out to being pretty long because when you have 45 to 48 minutes per episode, it's kind of like adding up to being about four hours of footage and of interviews and screenshots and all of these things that we could kind of see. So I really did like that it was four episodes. Maybe we'll see more of that kind of stuff in the future because they did state that this is season one, that Lula Rich, the documentary on Lula Rowe is season one. One. So maybe you'll see a season two about LuLaRoe again, maybe get more information, get more things talked about, expand on more things, or maybe, you know, they'll be diving into other companies. I'd be very curious to see what they end up doing. Included with that, I did like that they had different sides to be heard, right? Like I said, they interviewed Mark and Deanne themselves, the CEOs. I was actually very surprised that they agreed to the interview, but it is a good thing to be able to hear from them themselves. They even interviewed past reps, past employers, um, journalists, even former designers of LuLaRoe. So I really liked that they did do that many interviews, that they did make sure to touch on corporate workers, to journalists, to the MLM expert, Robert Fitzpatrick, that they talked to an actual rep who was willing to get interviewed. So I felt that that really helped the documentary have kind of every side of the story. I also think that this documentary, because I talked about it this whole hour that I've been talking, um, I think that it helped and can help a lot of reps see the similarities between LuLaRoe and their MLM that they're in right now, they may be able to say like, wait, that happened in that MLM. And wait, that's happening in mine too. I'm not sure where I seen it, but I think Roberta did state that I think she was getting interviewed by someone. And now I can't remember. I'm sorry. If I remember, I will link the interview down below because I definitely want to give credit, but I don't remember where I saw it at now. I'm sorry, but uh, Roberta, the, the former rep actually got interviewed and said that people are already in her DMs and emailing her from other MLMs saying that they've gone through the same thing or they're currently going through it. And similarities had been made from the LuLaRoe documentary to you know, the situation that they're in right now with their MLM. So I think that this can also hopefully help people kind of make those comparisons. So that is kind of my, I wouldn't say review. I feel like this was kind of a conversation. I just wanted to have a conversation with you guys and, and I wanted to be able to go through these episodes with you, but I do want to talk about one more thing before we go. I did post a community tab post where I did ask you guys, like, is there anything specific you want me to talk about in this video? And there were four specific things that I seen in the comments and that people wanted me to talk about. So I thought I would hit on those very quickly and kind of answer those questions that people wanted me to hit. So the first one was someone said, could you talk about the difference of the persona while being interviewed versus being deposed? I didn't really talk about this much, but it's very important for me to talk about if you have not watched the documentary. During the documentary, when Mark and Deanne were being interviewed by the people for, you know, the Lula Rich documentary, they would answer questions in this very like perky and exciting way. Like they were somewhat proud of themselves, right? They were proud of themselves for this MLM. But sometimes in each episode, they would actually pan the screen to Mark and Deanne at their deposition with the Washington lawsuit. So we would kind of see the differences between how they acted being interviewed for Lula Rich versus how they acted being spoken to in the deposition. So in my opinion, I really liked that they did that. I liked that Amazon kind of like added that in or, you know, the people who made this documentary added that in because we could see how were they answering the same or similar question in two different places. And it was interesting to watch because in the deposition, a lot of the times they would answer like, well, I don't know, versus being in interviewed for Lula Rich, they were like perky and happy and proud and like excited and energetic and actually answering the questions. So it was intriguing to see that if you watch the documentary, let me know what you think about that because I think it is interesting watching the deposition 
and how they would react to answers versus how they acted in the Lula Ridge, you know, interviews. The next thing said, are there any similarities in Lula Rose bonus checks to any aspects of Beachbody? So I wanted to ask you guys, did you want to see a video on this? I can kind of compare like another MLM, specifically Beachbody, to Lula Rose bonus checks and their rank structure and how people make money. Like the, the uplines make money from the downlines. I can compare the two. In my opinion, it, it is kind of similar with LuLaRoe. We talked about their five different ranks. And in order to rank up, you have to have people under you with Beachbody. Beachbody, same thing. So in Beachbody with those ranks, in order to maintain those ranks, guess what you have to do? You have to recruit people. And the people you recruit need to recruit. And all of those people have to stay active, meaning they have to buy products worth 50 PV or more, or they have to sell that in order to stay active each month. So I can actually do a separate video on this really showcasing the differences. And I can even look at other MLMs with it and compare a bunch of different MLMs and the rank structures and the bonus checks and stuff to see how similar they are. The last thing that was asked was how do you think people can hear and see all of the lawsuits and negative attention this company is getting and stay in? Did you hear the criticism about Beachbody and just ignore it or excuse it away? So for me, I'm going to answer the second question first. Did you hear the criticism about Beachbody and just ignore it? No, I didn't hear any criticism because I didn't look for it. When I was in Beachbody, I was in Beachbody for two years and I made it to the one star diamond rank, but quickly after making it to that rank, I quit and canceled my account and I never seen any criticism. I didn't know to look for it nor where to look for it at. I didn't have people around me that, you know, sent me videos or anything like that. The reason I ended up canceling my account with Beachbody is because I did see a video critiquing it. One of the individuals, one of my friends that I follow on Instagram posted Kiki Chanel's video and it was Kiki Chanel critiquing an MLM. So I clicked on it, I watched it and I was like, at first I was like, wait, what? No, this can't be true. And then I did my research and I looked into it more and I asked questions and I did my own research and I found out that 99% of what she said, I was never told. I didn't even know what income disclosure statements were. I didn't even know the FTC existed or the Better Business Bureau existed. I was 19 years old. I was a teenager. I didn't know much of anything at that point in my life. But once I found the information, I canceled my account. So then she said, you know, the how do people hear about these lawsuits and negative attention and stay in. I don't have the perfect way of saying this, but something that was said in the documentary sums this up perfectly. MLM expert Robert Fitzpatrick, you guys should totally look this individual up, but he stated, well, why do people join? They didn't join. They got lured in. He said, when you're inside a lie, a lie that had told you that you're in the right place at the right time and that the people around you have the right answer while everyone on the outside is wrong, you believe in this community. This is what a cult does. So I am not saying that the MLM at all is a cult. I'm not alleging that or anything like that, but I think he said it perfectly. It's like when you're in this MLM, your, your mindset is different. You're taught not to open yourself up to outside perspectives. You're taught that if you do open yourself up, like, or if you do hear criticism, that that person's wrong. And when you're in the MLM, you don't realize a lot of the times that those people are just trying to help you. And like the MLM expert said, he said, when you're inside a lie, a lie that told you you're in the right place at the right time and that the people around you have the right answer and everyone on the outside is wrong, you believe in it. You believe your community. You believe the people that you believe. That's a lot of beliefs. You know, don't take a shot every time I say believe or you're going to get drunk out here. But <laughs> essentially, when you're in the company and you believe them, you believe that the community is there for you. You believe that everyone could see success. You believe all of those things. Things, you're not going to be open to the outside. And that's what I see. I see a lot of people just trying to make excuses for it or a lot of people that didn't even listen or watch the documentary because they're probably told by their uplines that they shouldn't or they're told by people that, oh, don't listen to that. That's negative. They're lying, whatever. I actually have a video coming up of an individual who did a 20 minute IGTV talking about Lula Rich and essentially started her video off by telling the reps, oh, you don't need to watch that. You know, it's wrong. They're all biased. So when you hear your upline saying that, people don't even go watch the videos or listen to the critique. So that's kind of what I've experienced as my time kind of like watching this over the past year and a half that I've been making content criticizing multi-level marketing companies. But I'd love to know what you guys have to say about that. If you were ever in an MLM, did you listen to the critiques? Would you have listened to this documentary when you were in the mindset you were when you were in the MLM? I'd love to know. But essentially, that's all I've got for you guys today. I would love to know what you guys thought about Lula Rich in general. I would love to have conversations down below. What part was 
eye-opening to you guys. I feel like that's what I want to see. I felt like there was so much eye-opening to me. Like I literally wrote 23 pages of notes because I was just astonished. And then I had to be like, okay, Deanna, you cannot do and read to, and, and have a conversation about 23 pages of notes, okay? <laughs> or you'll be here way too long. So I would just love to know because I kind of had to shorten this. Uh, so I didn't get to talk about everything. So I'd love to talk to you guys down below about what you found most eye-opening. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I upload every Monday and Friday and I upload on my vlog channels on Wednesdays and I will see you guys in the next video.